Thank you. First of all, thank you guys for having me and uh, for this opportunity to talk to you about this important topic. I, I just have a few minutes with you today, so I thought I'd share with you my thoughts on, on this issue of upward mobility, empowerment, and opportunity in the 21st century. The thing I always talk about when I get into politics, the thing that I view everything I do through the lens of is my own personal experience. And some of you may be familiar with it by now, but my parents were working class folks. They immigrated to the United States, and my dad was basically a bartender. My mom worked all kinds of jobs. She was a stock clerk at Kmart, um, a cashier at hotels, a maid uh, at a casino in Las Vegas where we lived for a period of time. But what defined their lives was wanting the opportunity to give us a chance to do all the things they never had a chance to do. That was really the purpose and meaning of their life. You know, for a lot of different reasons outside of their own control, they were not able to be who they wanted to be. I, I think some of us need to stop and realize our parents were once our age. <laughs> and when they were our age, they had hopes for themselves as well. There were things they wanted to do with their life. And sometimes, sometimes they did that. But sometimes, through no fault of their own, it became impossible. And so the purpose of their life was to give us the chance to do all the things they never had a chance to do. Now that's my story, but it's just not a unique story. That's probably your story, or so many of your So whether it's the story you're living right now, or it's the story of your grandparents, your great-grandparents, your parents, or yourself. The thing that's defined us as a nation and as a people, perhaps more than anything else, is that we have been that place where it didn't really matter where you came from, or at least we've always said that that's who we want to be. And the American story, as much as anything else, has been that continuous struggle to ensure that we are that place where it doesn't matter where you're born or who you're born to or how your last name is pronounced or how poor your parents were or what they did for a living. You shouldn't be limited by any of that. That we've always said that we believe that if you have a good idea and you have talent, you should be able to go as far as your hard work and your talent will take you. That's come to define our culture and our society. We all say that. So the question for policymakers like myself is, what is our job in regards to that, other than just to talk about it, other than just to constantly brag about the fact that that's who we've been and that's who we want to continue to be, what can we do about it? What, what can government do and what is the role of policymakers in making that possible? And I think in the year and a half that I've been thinking about this, I've come to the conclusion that this really is the central issue of, of, that we're debating. That virtually every other issue we're talking about, whether it's government spending or the role and size of government or tax policy or regulatory policy or energy policy, all these economic issues are directly linked to the central goal of ensuring that we are a place where people can do better than their parents did and where people can do better than they once were. That in essence, those who are in poverty can pull themselves into the middle class. Those who are in the middle class can maintain themselves there or reach even higher. And we don't have to do that at the expense of people who have already made it, made it. That in essence, we can grow our economy and therefore grow opportunities so that instead of being a zero-sum game, we can all benefit without, without having to take away from anybody else. And I hope that that's what guides our policy debates in the new Congress. Now look, I'll be perfectly blunt with you because I don't want to waste your time into believing that somehow in the weeks that are left before the next election, this Congress is all of a sudden going to get active and start passing a bunch of stuff that's going to be helpful. But I do think, irrespective of how the elections turn out this November, in January, I hope we'll get a fresh start on this issue and that we'll be focused like a laser on making sure that, 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 that the, this incre increasingly becomes a nation where people can leave their children better off than themselves and where they can accomplish their own hopes and dreams and that every issue we take on, every issue we take on is viewed through that lens. I hope that that's what the debate will become about. Now, there's two things at play here that I think have to be balanced. And let me, let me start by saying I fully acknowledge that my dad was a bartender, my mom was a stock clerk at Kmart. But I understand that in the 21st century, in the year 2012, a bartender and a stock clerk cannot give their children the opportunities that a bartender and a stock clerk were able to give us two decades ago. The world is just a different place. In many ways, the world has an opportunity to be a much better place but we have to recognize that reality. And so our dual goals need to be, on the one hand, we need an economy that's vibrant and growing, an economy that's creating opportunities, not just for jobs, but for businesses, an economy that, that has uh, both the consumer buying power, but also the, the, the conditions necessary for people to go out and open a business out of the spare bedroom of their home and have it succeed, 
for people to be able to go out and find a job in the field that they studied for, a vibrant, growing economy that has room for us to pursue our dreams and our hopes. Because it doesn't matter how great an idea you have, it doesn't matter how innovative your product is, if people can't afford to buy it, if people can't afford to pay for it, you're not going to get very far. So the one goal is to grow our economy dynamically, or to create the conditions for our economy to grow dynamically. But the other thing that goes hand in hand with that is making sure that our people are prepared to take advantage of those opportunities. Because you can create all the great jobs in the world, but if your people do not have the skills to do that job, you're not going to be able to succeed in the goal that we have. And I think that we're falling short on both ends right now. And I, I actually started thinking about this when I was a state legislator. For example, for the life of me, I do not understand why over the last two decades we have stigmatized career education in America. You go to any hospital, at least in South Florida, and you look at the job postings, and it's opening after opening of good paying jobs in the medical field that are not being filled. In fact, sometimes we are importing people from abroad to do these jobs in nursing and other sorts of things. Why aren't we producing that? Why aren't we, why aren't we creating capacity to educate people? That's just one example. Maybe it's different in different parts of the country. The point is, we all know, I have met, personally met kids, for example, that want to fix airplane engines or want to be a BMW technician, which, by the way, these jobs for an 18-year-old pay really well. Imagine if we could graduate kids from high school, not just with a high school diploma, but with an industry certification and a career. And there's nothing wrong with those jobs. Those are good jobs and we need them. By the same token, I think we need to be honest with our college graduates. I think we should have the freedom to study anything you want, but you deserve to know that if you're going to go into a certain major, here are, when you graduate, here are the jobs that are available to you, to you, and here are how much those jobs pay. And you should know that before you take out $50,000 in loans. And so when I, when I leave here today, I'm going to be joining Senator Wyden, uh, who, who him and I are working together on a bipartisan basis to pass a bill called Right to Know Before You Go, which creates the mechanisms for this to be possible. Listen, I, I, I come from personal experience on that. You know, I graduated with over $125,000 in student loans. 125,000 student loans. Every month, some lady called Sally May was taking 700 bucks <laughs> out of my account. So uh, anyway, and uh, <laughs> if she's watching, uh, no. Look, but, my, but, but, but the point is that, that we also need to recognize that we've got to re-examine how we pay for higher education. Be because here's the brutal truth. And we've got to be honest with ourselves and with our kids. In the 21st century, there are going to be no good, you will not be able to make enough money. There will not be good paying jobs for people that have no advanced education. That doesn't mean necessarily a four year degree, that doesn't mean a PhD, that doesn't mean an MBA necessarily, but it does mean that unless you have a skill, unless you have a skill, you are going to really struggle to make it. And the sooner we tell that to kids and the more honest we are about that to ourselves, and to the next generation, the better off we're going to be. But then we got to react to that. One thing is to recognize it, another thing is to do something about it, to create the conditions where that's possible. Here's the other challenge we have. People will go into a career, and not only do you lose your job, but the entire industry you work for no longer exists because a new industry has replaced it. What do you do with people that are 35 years of age, studied in a certain field, and the field no longer exists? We've got to create mechanisms for those folks to be able to get retrained into a new career. And we may have to do that a couple of times in our lifetime. Again, that's a fact in the 21st century. Whether we like it or not, that's what we have. And that's what we should pursue. So these are the kinds of challenges we face. And everything we do should be through the lens of that. And here's the good news. I don't think this has to be a partisan issue. There's nothing partisan about opportunity. Now, look. For all the bad news you hear about the bickering in Washington, our parties, the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, has a, have a very honest difference of opinion about the role of government, the size of government, and what government should or should not be doing. That's a good debate to have. I hope we will continue to have it. What I do think we all agree on is that we want to be a country where if you have a good idea, you should be able to take it as far as it can go. And so the question that we should be debating 
is not who's a good guy and who's a bad guy or who's a, you know, the, 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 the debate we should be having is what can we do to make that more possible? What can we do given the challenges of this new century to open those doors? Here's what I am 100% a believer in. I think the 21st century, I believe the 21st century has the very realistic opportunity of being the most prosperous century in human history. I do. I think more people will be pulled out of poverty in this new century than ever in human history. I think poverty will dramatically decline around the world. I think that this generation of Americans and the generations that will follow it have the chance to be the most secure and most prosperous generation of Americans ever. I know that's hard to believe with all the bad news that you hear in the press today, but I think that opportunity is there. The just think about what the 21st century means in practical terms. There are now millions of people all over the world who just a decade ago were living in deep poverty, who now have enough money in their pocket to buy the stuff that you might build or invent, to buy the services you offer, to visit the United States as tourists and leave money in your businesses, to be your partners in a business endeavor. And we have the technology to connect with them like never before. We have opportunities at collaboration that have never existed. You couldn't talk to someone halfway around the world before without having a huge long distance bill. Now you can talk to them in real time for virtually zero cost. You used to only be able to collaborate with people that lived in your immediate vicinity. Now your business partner or the person you're collaborating with on the next great idea can live anywhere in the world as long as they have access to a mobile device that's linked to the net. Now, think about the opportunities on that. What about the opportunities of productivity? The ability to gain access to information faster than ever before. These are real opportunities that can dramatically change the quality of life on this planet for everyone, and which I think we are uniquely positioned to lead on because of our freedoms, because of our liberties, and because of our history of success. I also think, by the way, that we as a nation are uniquely positioned as a people to take advantage of the opportunities of the 21st century. Because it's no exaggeration to say that it, it's in our DNA. You've heard politicians in both parties say that. But think about who we are. Think about who you are. You are the descendant of a go-getter. Every single person in this room is the son, daughter, granddaughter, or grandson of someone who overcame extraordinary obstacles. Every single one of us. Think about what it meant. Think about what it meant to overcome not just the institution of slavery, but of segregation to stake your claim to the American dream. Think about what it meant to overcome having to immigrate to a country where you didn't speak the language and didn't know anybody and were able to get ahead in life. Their blood runs through our veins. That's who we are. And that's why the world's inspired by us. Even though there are many parts of the world where they get angry at us, where they protest against us, there is no nation on this planet that cannot find someone just like them here doing in this nation what they would never be able to do over there. That's who we are. That's who we've been. And we can be that now more than ever if only we grasp the opportunities of this new century and pursue them. So I'm excited about this opportunity because, you see, at the end of the day, this is what gives purpose to public service. This is what makes it meaningful. This is what makes it fun to go to work every day, to know that you're working on stuff that's going to have a real impact. To be able to leave here, this place whenever my service here is done and, and be able to tell my kids the reason why I was away from home so often, the reason why I missed some activities that maybe I wish I hadn't missed in your lives is because I was making a difference. Because I was out working on behalf of these sorts of things. We're not going to get it all right, but we can get most of it right, a lot of it right, in very real ways to impact real people. And that's what I'm excited about the opportunity to be a part of. So we're going to have an election. These elections are going to get contentious. People are going to say mean things about each other, as you well know, and it's already happening. People are going to be divided about these issues. That's our republic. But I hope after this election, irrespective of the outcome, we will all as a nation come to recognize this extraordinary chance we have of making this new century the most, the most exciting time in human history and the unique opportunity we have as Americans not just to lead by example, but to create for our people a chance of prosperity that no people have ever known. It's, it's, there's nothing wrong with our people. The American people, the young men and women that I run into every single day, especially this new generation, people under the age of 25, that are the greatest collaborators in the history of the world. They're already used to, just by the way they've grown up working with people on stuff. I've met some of the smartest people I've ever known. 
who today are not doing well in school. You know why? Because their curriculum isn't speaking to their hopes and dreams. If only we could get them into a place where they're studying stuff they like. Because as my dad used to tell me, He used to say it in Spanish, so it's not going to sound as good. But in English, let me tell you what it, what it translates to. He used to say, if you do something that you like but you're not good at it, it's called a hobby. If you do something that you're, that you're good at but you don't like, it's called a job. But if you get to do something that you love and that you're good at, that's a career. And that's what we need, careers. And what we want to figure out And, that we, what we, and, and, and so in my life, I had hobbies. You know, I, I loved football. The problem is there weren't a lot of 5'9", 170 pounders in the National Football League. So, and had it not been for my lack of size, speed, and talent, I would have played in the NFL. <laughs> so that was my hobby. Then I went to work at a law firm billing hours. And, you know, I went to a law degree. And that was, I mean, I went to night life. But I didn't love doing that. I didn't love billing hours at a law firm, and that was my job. But at least now, at this stage in my life, I have an opportunity to make public service, to, to make pu public policy, and to bring my life experience to that realm. I love what I do, and I hope I'll be good at it. Because if I am, it'll give purpose and meaning to it, and then I can say I, I had a career. Although I hope it won't be the only career I have in my life. Um, but the, the point is that th this is the chance we have to do for people all over this country. This is the opportunity before us, and I hope we'll take it. It's a unique one. It's an exciting one. And I'm just glad at what Opportunity Nation is doing to bring people together from all across this country. I, for one, hope that I can become a leader on this issue, working with all of you and with my colleagues in the United States Senate to ensure that the next couple years becomes the Opportunity Agenda. Thank you for having me. Thank you.